Britain's Theresa May went to the scenic Austrian city of Salzburg this week. I'm confident we will reach a deal. And to do so, European leaders have told her your plan does not work. We're seeing on the uh, front pages of the British newspapers just how badly this went for her. Seems to leave her Brexit plans in chaos. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the stories we're covering this week. Brexit brings out the worst in the British papers. Brussels does not approve, but the satirists strike it rich. Keep calm and carry on. Mahathir, the sequel. Journalists in Malaysia wonder what's in it for them and the country's media space. And more than two years after their publication, the Panama Papers are still making news. Britain is more than two years into the painful process of negotiating its way out of the European Union, and the media angle to this story is no mere sideshow. When the EU's Justice Commissioner, Vera Jourova, said this past week that the news media can sow divisions, spread disinformation, and encourage exclusion, she said that the Brexit debate is the best example of that. Many of Britain's papers, especially the tabloids like The Sun and The Daily Mail, are playing an outsized role, stoking the political flames, pushing their pro-leave agendas. In fact, the day after the EU rejected Prime Minister Theresa May's Brexit proposal, The Sun's front page served up yet another example of that, another reminder of the role it played in the 2016 referendum that landed Britain where it is today. It's not just the politicians who have a lot to answer for on this story. Our starting point this week is London. Four voices on Brexit and the UK media. On the Leave side, a former political editor at both the Sunday Times and the Daily Mail. Papers that want the UK out of the EU. As an island, we've never been fully part of the European project. On the Remain side, a journalist campaigning for a more reasoned debate on issues pertaining to the EU. The British media system uh, has failed. And two academics. One studies journalism for the Reuters Institute. Much of the newspaper industry historically has been very skeptical uh, of Europe. Uh, the other teaches journalism and advocates for the reform of the British media. The right-wing press have a lot of responsibility to bear. One of the curious things about this story is just how unsurprising it was, the political development and the coverage. Prime Minister Theresa May's blueprint for Britain's exodus from the EU, the terms under which the UK would depart, did not even have the support of her own party. At what point it was decided that Brexit means remain? Let alone the opposition parties. Had EU officials somehow agreed to May's proposal, that would have been real news. But they didn't. About the only people surprised by that, or who feigned surprise, with a little outrage thrown in, was Britain's pro-Brexit tabloid press. What a great headline that was. Yes, this language is emotive, but this is a tabloid paper. It is a red-blooded tabloid designed for red-blooded readers who have strong views on where we are going with the Brexit negotiation. I think Sun readers look for that full throttle coverage. The Sun is not a newspaper that is on the one hand, on the other. The Sun is a newspaper that takes its position and goes for it. To see that such an important, uh, fragile, delicate moment can be uh, used uh, by the media to whip up uh, really what is essentially hate it was extremely, extremely dangerous. Today, in the current situation in which we have a country profoundly divided, to use a kind of rhetoric is completely irresponsible. The sort of language that talks about two-bit mobsters of the European Union reflects a discourse that's been going on around coverage of the EU for the last two decades. It's always been about um, the contest between the UK and the EU rather than a more collaborative relationship. Uh, so that's been based on a lot of conflictual understandings and sometimes downright lies, but it fits a discourse around this idea of the EU being a very bullying and nannying construct that is taking away powers from the UK. But who is really bullying whom? 
the European Union takes issue with the kind of coverage it gets in many of its member states. Brussels has become kind of a journalistic shorthand for a political body many European media outlets depict as remote, out of touch, and overly bureaucratic. Which is why this past week, when the EU's Justice Commissioner spoke of news outlets that are divisive, exclusionary, and dealing in misinformation, she made it clear she wasn't just talking about the media in the UK. Almost daily, we could find examples of stories. What she did say was that the British press has produced some of the most divisive EU coverage. Sadly, I don't think that it would have any kind of effect in Britain because it seems that anything that comes from uh, Europe at the moment uh, is mostly distorted and turned on its head. This is a consequence of the transformation of the media because there is no incentive, especially in a landscape which is extremely competitive, in being the ones who foster dialogue and harmony. Dialogue and harmony doesn't uh, uh, pile up click, uh, clicks on the net. Well, I don't think anyone in the British media is going to take lessons from anyone in Brussels over the rhetoric and the kind of demeanor of the debate. It's hardly as if the EU and its officials are entirely guilt-free in this dialogue. Clearly, we don't want it to become more hateful or hate-filled, but it's not a problem for it to be colourful, for it to be passionate, because you know what? People are really fired up about this. Which begs the following questions. If the British really are that fired up about the EU and Brexit, how did they get that way? And are the newspapers, the tabloids in particular, reporting on the public mood, or are they producing it? The referendum result in 2016 was close, 52% in favor of leaving to 48. At the time, pro-leave papers were far more numerous and more widely read. 73% of the newspapers sold in the UK favored Brexit. Only 27% of the papers sold opposed it. The country was evenly split. The newspapers were not, reflecting the views of their owners, who are mostly conservative, as opposed to their readers. Media analysts describe those papers as Euro-skeptical. What they really are is Euro-hostile, a term that also applies to Boris Johnson, a politician who has seen the EU story from both sides. The Conservative MP and former Cabinet Minister campaigned hard for Brexit, making dubious claims to journalists about simple solutions that have since proven untrue. Why are we sending £10 billion a year net to Brussels, some of which is spent on Spanish bullfighting? Johnson used to be a journalist, although not a very good one. In the late 1980s, he was fired by the Times of London for making up quotes, then hired by the Daily Telegraph and assigned to Brussels to cover the EU. It was there that Johnson honed his anti-EU messaging, developing a style of coverage that was later emulated by other British journalists. Boris Johnson did not invent the current form of coverage of the European Union that we see in the British uh, medium, but he is a, a good symbol of it in the way that as a journalist he had a keen eye for the sort of quite engaging, often funny and occasionally uh, misleading while outright false a story about seemingly quirky forms of European uh, legislation or regulation around food, you know, curved bananas and the like. But it's only partly about the media. It's also very much about politics. And of course, Boris Johnson made the journey from being a journalist to being a commentator and to being now a very prominent conservative politician. And he was very well known for uh, not showing up at the press conferences and then going to the office and making it up uh, uh, whatever he thought was funny or hilarious to ridicule the EU. Someone who has been uh, responsible for that kind of uh, uh, disinformation, lies and irresponsible journalism then ended up to benefit it, from it politically. The pro-Brexit press in the UK does not limit its antagonism to the EU. Two years ago, when a British court ruled that Parliament had the constitutional right to have the last say on Brexit, the Daily Mail declared the judges involved enemies of the people and reported that one of them was openly gay. The Daily Mail is one of the country's biggest selling newspapers. It's a good deal more popular than it is trustworthy, which is not as contradictory as it may appear. Popularity and trust is not the same thing. And this is really clear when you look at the trust scores of individual tabloid brands. Lots of people really like 
the Daily Mail or really like the Sun for lots of reasons. They find it funny, they find it something that sort of you know, gets their blood pressure up, but it's not necessarily something they consider a particularly trustworthy source of information. Trust in all news organisations is dropping. It's dropping most for the tabloid press, that's true. People no longer know who to trust, and it's largely to do with media elites and political elites. And the entanglement of power between media elites and political elites makes them even more distrusted because people know that they work together and that that's where power resides. We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar today with one of our producers, Johanna Hus. Joe, we've been keeping an eye on the media story in Hungary for a few years now, and this past week, yet another news outlet was taken over. It has new owners. What are the details? Well, Richard, the website in question is index.hu, Hungary's largest independent news outlet. One of the new owners is Joseph Uldjan, a media investor and a member of a political party currently in coalition with Prime Minister Viktor Orban's party, Fidesz. Now, whilst the new owners have insisted that the publication's independence is guaranteed, staff there are warning of a doomsday scenario in which the website could be made to parrot the Fidesz party's ideological agenda. 88 employees have signed a statement saying that if there are any changes, we will notify the world as loud as we possibly can. But we've seen this kind of thing before. Pro-Orban business tycoons taking over news outlets critical of the Orban government, promising not to tamper with the editorial policies and then reneging. There's a pattern here, isn't there? Yes, there is. Over the past four years, dozens of newspapers, radio and television channels uh, critical of Orban have changed hands. Some have subsequently shut down, others have drastically changed their editorial line. Just last month, we reported on the takeover of Here TV. One of its new owners, Jolt Nierges, insisted he would not get involved in the channel's work, but that same night, he cancelled one of Here TV's political talk shows and in its place broadcast a speech by Orban on a loop. So there's good reasons for concerns that index.hu will go the same way. Moving on now to the Panama Papers investigations, first published in 2016 that made news in so many countries. Namibia was just one of them, but now a lawsuit has resulted. What can you tell us about Henner Diekman, the lawyer who's filed the suit, and the paper he's suing, The Namibian? Well, The Namibian is the country's largest newspaper, and it published two stories in 2016 and in 2017 linking Diekman to companies used by alleged mafia kingpin Vito Palazzolo. Now, Namibia was an important port of call for the Sicilian mafia's drug trade in the 1990s and early 2000s, and Palazzolo reportedly had multiple bank accounts there. According to the Namibian's report, Diekman was the lawyer of choice for anyone wanting to invest in companies related to Palazzolo. Digman denies the allegations and demands that the newspaper retracts the articles, apologizes or pays him $20,000 in damages. And how's the paper responding? Well, Tangeni Amupadi, the Namibian's editor, who's also named as a defendant in the case, called the lawsuit an attempt to intimidate and stop us and the rest of the news media from writing about people who clearly have a lot of resources uh, to keep their activities secret. We have followed the best journalistic practices and standards when publishing these articles, and we stand by our reporting. He also said that the lawsuit would be a killer for his paper, as potential defeat would mean legal cost five times greater than the damages sought. Okay, thanks, Joe. A muzzled media, corruption in government, and a silenced opposition. Many Malaysians are hoping those things are now behind them, with the ousting of Najib Razak from the Prime Minister's office four months ago. However, the country's new leader, Mahathir Mohamed, is no stranger to media censorship or corruption. Mahathir has already spent 22 years as prime minister and was known for locking up political opponents, shutting down newspapers and remoulding media legislation. But that was the old Mahathir, allegedly. This new one has pulled a U-turn in his approach to the media. News sites shut down by Najib are now back online and Mahathir has repealed one of the more contentious laws passed by his predecessor, the Anti-Fake News Act. But many onlookers still wonder, understandably, if this new Mahathir won't turn out the same as the old one, given that much of the system he's talking about dismantling was built by him. The Listening Post's Flo Phillips now on what Mahathir Mohammed's change of tune might mean for the Malaysian media. Betul, 
Perdana Menteri Malaysia sebelah ni. Mahathir Mohamad, the seventh Prime Minister of Malaysia, was also its fourth. In his first stint from 1981 to 2003, he gained a reputation as an autocrat. This time round, as he vowed in his campaign video, things will be different. Mahathir had shown that he's not the old Mahathir, and I think He's uh, constantly reminded of the fact that he had these 22 years of terror. He's the man of the moment. He's very popular. He is now someone who can do no wrong. It is clearly unpredictable. But what is important is that we would uh, judge him by, by his action. Not many people start a new job or change their politics at age 93. Mahathir did both. He left his own party to lead the opposition, partnering with a man that he'd put in prison, Anwar Ibrahim. And Mahathir made freedom of expression a big part of his election campaign. This is the same man that the Committee to Protect Journalists branded an enemy of the press back in 1999. The most uh, notorious thing that he did was Operation Lala, which happened in 1987. So these 100 over people were taken in and detained without trial. On top of that, at least three newspapers were suspended. It instilled in society the culture of fear. Over two decades in power, Mahathir introduced and tightened legislation to keep news outlets in check. There was the Printing Presses and Publication Act, which kept news outlets on their best behavior by requiring them to reapply for their license every year. The Official Secrets Act was broadened in scope and used to prosecute dissidents and journalists. Mahathir also introduced the Communications and Multimedia Act, which was later used to target the media and activists for content published online. Journalist Stephen Gann set up an independent news outlet in 1999. He remembers the legal hoops and requirements he had to go through. When we thought of setting up a, uh, an alternative you know, the, uh, media in Malaysia, it was difficult for us to actually uh, do print. There's no way that we could get a license. So the internet was our last resort. Uh, we were called traitors by Mahathir. Our office were raided by the police. Almost two dozen of our computers were taken away and they were not returned to us until about two years later. That was really an attempt to shut us down. I believe that the Prime Minister has changed. He has reformed, he has transformed. And we have promised that we are going to do away with some of the laws that are considered inhibiting press freedom and inhibiting the freedom of expression generally. So we are now not looking back, we are looking forward. The rehabilitation of Mahathir's image is the accidental legacy of the previous Prime Minister, Najib Razak, a former protégé of Mahathir's. In 2015, Najib was found to have been at the centre of a global corruption scandal involving the State Development Fund, One Malaysia Development Berhad, known as 1MDB. Under Najib's watch, the fund lost $4.5 billion through shell companies and opaque transactions that spread across 10 countries. 681 million of that, according to US prosecutors, was found in Najib's personal bank account. Once the 1MDB scandal hit the headlines, Najib made use of the repressive laws that he'd inherited, and he came up with one of his own, the Anti-Fake News Act. That whole fake news is connected to the whole 1MDB scandal or any other corruption cases that involves the government. So basically what they're trying to say is that don't believe anything that you see on the internet unless we say so or unless we sanction. So this whole fake news thing was basically the last act that Najib had put out there just before the elections uh, to try to scare people. The government tried to, you know, to, uh, to use the anti-fake news law against Mahathir during the election campaign. Uh, Mahathir was claiming that there was an attempt to stop him from actually putting his uh, nomination papers in time. And the fact that he's repealed this anti-fake news law, uh, it shows that, you know, that, that he's taking the step uh, in the right direction. Mahathir did away with the Anti-Fake News Act last month, but there are other laws. The Sedition Act, 
introduced under British colonial rule back in 1948, still remains in effect. The definition of sedition under that law is extremely broad, and in 2015 alone, Najib used the law 91 times, almost five times as often as during the first 50 years of the law's existence. One of the people accused under that law was a cartoonist, Zuna. Zunar has always had trouble publishing his work. During Mahathir's previous time in office, none of the major newspapers would dare hire him. But over the last 10 years, Zunar found that he didn't need publishers. He self-published on social media and highlighted the corruption of Najib and Najib's wife, Rosma, whose many luxury handbags and diamonds were a gift to satirical cartoonists. That didn't go down well. Zunar was charged with sedition nine times and banned from leaving the country. When the new government came into power, I found out that my travel ban had been lifted. They also dropped all the sedition charges against me. Uh, thank you very much for that. But uh, I think this is still not enough. So the interpretation is very, very big and anybody can be victim of it. Uh, you draw a cartoon, sedition. Somebody writes something, sedition. If you do some speech, it's seditious. What the government needs to do is to abolish the sedition as at all. In the months after the election, Malaysia and Mahathir experienced a sort of honeymoon period. They came together to oppose Najib whose trial date has been set with full media access, despite Najib's request for a gag order. However, Mahathir's campaign promise to review all repressive media regulation remains unfulfilled. And in August, Mahathir announced that the Official Secrets Act is here to stay. There are other things that he needs to do in order to uh, redeem himself. He needs to bring back the independence of the judiciary so that we have a real democracy. The judiciary has been emasculated and it was done by him in those days. It would be a real test of his sincerity to, to give it back its independence. I think uh, uh, he's redeeming himself. He has allowed people to debate on so many issues. And you can see columns and articles written uh, questioning him, insulting him or criticising him. And uh, we haven't seen anyone you know, complaining that he's been told to uh, snip it or zip up. So far, not yet. Yeah, this is Mahadev. I portray him like a crocodile. He destroyed every institution in Malaysia, so Malaysian people they have to play a very active role now to strengthen the institution. You have to understand before, Mahathir is a dictator, and we don't change dictator. And dictator doesn't change. And finally, back to Britain and the campaign calling for a second Brexit referendum. A number of artists there are backing the movement on social media. Musicians Becca and Michael Hamway have formed a group they call the Herald Patch. They've released a song entitled, Oh, What a Lovely Brexit. It's a parody of that old stage musical based on World War I, Oh, What a Lovely War. And like the original, the song relies on that staple of British humor, irony, to tell Britons that it's not too late to jump back up the cliff. We'll leave you now with a little sampling of the tune, and we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. I'm awfully glad about Brexit. We're digging for victory, chaps. We planted a quinsulin, got a new mincer in, hens for the eggs and a pig for the insulin. What do we care if supply chains collapse? We'll make our own medicines from scraps. We're taking control of our borders, our primary sovereign intent. Now we preside over the white cliffs of Dover. We're turning them into a lorry. Layover. The Garden of England is ours to cement. Sing ho, all ye yeomen of Kent. We're starting a shiny new era of pulling together as one. From you to Clanfarian, let this 
Ducky a clarion. Forage for roadkill. Keep calm and carrion. We won't take commands from a frog or a hun. England, ah.